after these things. Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave his permission. So he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and they wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had been laid. And so, because it was the preparation, the day of preparation, the tomb was nearby, and they laid Jesus there. Every year for centuries, Christians have entered into Holy Week. Holy Week, which even though it comes up every year, depending on where you're at in your journey, it can feel odd. It can feel ancient. It can feel foreign for a number of reasons. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is the one that is celebrated. It's the Easter story that we're most familiar with. But Holy Saturday and the human experience it represents is really not as odd or ancient or foreign as we might think. Holy Saturday involves a human experience that I believe most of us Not all, but most of us are familiar with. The death of someone you love is shocking. Anytime it happens. The death of someone you love is shocking any way that it happens. Death is shocking even when we know it's coming. Death is shocking. Today is April 15th. My father, David Lent, died nine years ago today. He had been living with chronic leukemia for three years. His quality of life had been excellent. And he was able to continue to do almost everything that he wanted to do. And he and we, as a family, were warned that and more likely when, his chronic leukemia turned acute, there would be very little time left, as in days. He was diagnosed at 69 years of age. They put him on oral chemo immediately, and the only side effects were fatigue. My dad pushed back on the need for rest. He was quite athletic and very proud of it. He'd been an avid tennis player for years. He'd had the opportunity to retire early at age 63, and he took it. And I think the day after his retirement party, he started playing doubles almost every day. He was not about to give in to fatigue. My mom used to compare his attitude to a very young child fighting the daily nap. No, 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 no. He refused to go into the bedroom in the middle of the day and lay down for an hour, as the doctor had prescribed, he said it made him feel old. And instead, every day after lunch, he would go into the living room, take a seat on the sofa, and fall asleep sitting up. (laughs) But you had better not call that a nap. Because his physical appearance in those three years really didn't change. And his routine, as far as we could tell, really didn't change. And he continued playing doubles almost daily. And he never complained. It was easy to forget he was sick. 
And then his leukemia turned acute. We can know that death is coming, but when it does, it is a shock. To lose someone we love, a parent, a spouse, a friend, a sibling, God forbid, a child, our response is physical and emotional and spiritual, and it's one of shock and disbelief, even when we know death is coming. How do we function following the loss of a loved one? How do we pick ourselves up and put one foot in front of the other? How do we make all those phone calls and tell the story over and over and over again? How do we know what to do? How does the church know what to do? How do our friends and neighbors and co-workers know what to do? Ritual. Blessed ritual. When everything around us has changed, when it feels like the world is crumbling, with nothing is recognizable or comforting, Ritual is a kind of is an invisible underlying structure that holds us up when we cannot stand, holds us up when we cannot think clearly, holds us up when we no longer can see our future in front of our face. It's just a blank fog. Ritual insists we get out of bed in the morning. Ritual insists we continue to breathe in and breathe out. Ritual insists that we eat and we drink and we get dressed because ritual insists there are things we need to, have to do. Following the death of a loved one, there is so much that needs to be done. It can feel like an incredible heaviness, exhausting and overwhelming, but actually, that which must be done is a blessing. It doesn't feel that way in the moment. However, ritual following the death of a loved one when nothing else makes sense. Ritual provides structure and purpose and something recognizable. Ritual helps to keep us upright with the ability to somehow put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. Ritual will tell us we must, we have no choice. Ritual keeps us moving in this unavoidable grief of journey that we must take in order to heal. In our scripture, it is due to ritual that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus do what they do following the crucifixion. They've never been in a situation like this one. Surely they've lost loved ones to death before but this, this experience is horrific, what has happened. And in this moment of crisis, you know they are leaning hard on ritual. And what they do know is this. There has been the death of a loved one, and the Sabbath is coming. And that will inform their ritual response. So Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate to ask if they can take Jesus' body. And he's given permission. And Nicodemus, who's also a disciple of Jesus, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. And they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths according to the burial customs, rituals of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid and so... Because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Ritual got them to this place. And now comes another hard part. Related to the fact that everything one can do has been done. Now what? During Holy Week, it is so easy to skip over Holy Saturday. Most churches do. It is just a time of ritual waiting. And when we know how the story turns out, our sense is, why would we do that? We need Saturday to prepare for Easter. Easter's tomorrow. 
We need Saturday. We've got company coming. We've got to clean the house and get the rest of the groceries. We need to use this time wisely. So we know how the story turns out. Joseph and Nicodemus and all the disciples, they do not. They do not. They are in shock. They are in shock and disbelief. They are in shock that is raw and life as they knew it has been stolen from them. Everything we go through when we lose a loved one to death, these disciples are going through. Everyone who loved and followed Jesus is experiencing the pain and devastation of losing a son, a brother, a leader, a teacher, a friend, a confidant to death following torture and execution. So what do we do with Holy Saturday? We acknowledge it. We make room for it. Holy Saturday is so much a part of the human condition. Every time we lose a loved one to death, even when they die peacefully, even when we know it's coming, it is still a shock when it actually happens. We go through the rituals that help us to put one foot in front of the other, and there are many, and there are people who will help us lead, lead us through those blessed rituals, and we will be thankful for them, but when the planning is done, when the service is over, when everyone goes home, including out-of-town family, when you're finally left alone and all is quiet, and you realize that you can no longer imagine your future in front of your face, what now? What now? when the only ritual left is to wait. <laughs>